Welcome to LeaderCast, episode 232. You're listening to LeaderCast, Transforming Missions podcast with Tim Bias and Sarah Thomas, providing you with resources to navigate the challenges and opportunities of courageous, Christ-centered leaders. Sarah, what's the most unfashionable spiritual practice today? Is this going to be multiple choice? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hold on to that question as I remind you that you can find show notes for this episode at transformingmission.org forward slash 232. On the show notes page, you'll find ways to share the podcast as well as information that we explore on this episode. Tim, what's the most unfashionable spiritual practice today? I'm guessing that it might be one of the means of grace since that's our focus today. Well, you're guessing right. It is one of the means of grace. So I'm going to say fasting, mostly because of all of the means of grace. It's the one that I find the most difficult and the one that I see others having the most difficulty with. So today, as we round third and head toward home in the Hope and the Means of Grace uh, series, Let me remind you, this has been a twofold purpose, this series. Number one, to encourage you as as Christians, but as Christ-centered leaders, to tend to your faith formation. And number two, to revisit the means of grace as a source of hope. I see what you did there, Tim Bias. You dropped a little baseball metaphor in. So in each of the episodes, we'll explore one big idea as well as answer two questions. What's the leadership message and where is hope? So today we're exploring hope in fasting, as we've already said. So first, let's look at the challenges that come up in our current culture around fasting. You have a a challenge, Sarah? I don't know if it's, well, it's it's a big big category, consumerism. So do I need to say more? (laughs) Well, I think we can make the assumption, but since it's a podcast, yes. Okay, folks, this might be a long episode um, or a short episode, depending on the way that you look at it. So I say consumerism because it's counter to fasting. We're in a world that has an attention span of a flea consuming social media, news, anything on our mobile devices. But consumerism also in the instant gratification of, oh, Amazon two-day delivery, order it online, get it now. And since you brought up a baseball, Tim, last year, my mom ordered a Miguel Cabrera baseball bat for my nephew. I think it was in celebration of the number of hits that he had. She ordered it and then found out it would be a three to six month wait before it arrived. His birthday was still a couple of months away, but having to wait for something you order online is contrary to how we think about things. So that's just an example of how consumerism plays into being counter to fasting. And you have me thinking about shipping delays, that there's, there's things that we've experienced during this uh, pandemic. Or the pants that I ordered two weeks ago that still haven't arrived. You can sense the annoyance in my voice. You know, it, it shouldn't take something two weeks to get from California to central Ohio, but sometimes it does. <clears throat> well, I think, Television and the internet have created consumers of all of us. You know, social media has added to the challenge. Our appetites for knowledge, information, entertainment, and other stuff has continued to grow. It hasn't lessened. And since I've mentioned appetite, even food can be delivered to our doorsteps in little or no time. I think what we're pointing to with these examples is fasting is countercultural in a world that is often surrounded by abundance. Abundance to the point that in some form, many of us are guilty of gluttony. But that's a topic for another day. Tim, let's look at some biblical examples of fasting to get to the leadership message around fasting as a means of grace. Sure, let's, we'll start in the Old Testament. Um, I think the image is in the Old Testament. Fasting was done primarily for one reason, and that was repentance for unfaithfulness. 
And I think you can look in Samuel, Second Samuel and Nehemiah, and you can see that sometimes it was tribes that fasted together, community, because of God's judgment. And at other times, it was just individual fasting. And when we look at unfaithfulness, it, it, it's not the only reason for fasting in the Old Testament. Sometimes leaders would fast to seek God's assistance. And again, I just, you'll find these, I think, in the, in the show notes, but it, we can reference 1 Samuel, 2 Chronicles, Ezra. And sometimes fasting was a result of grief. David fasted following the death of King Saul and Jonathan. You can find that in 1 Samuel. There's one more type of fasting in the Old Testament, I think, and we jump over to one of my favorite Old Testament books, and that's Numbers. And you, you read in Numbers 6 chapter, there was something known as the Nazarite vow, and this was fasting as a form of purification. This might give more of a foundation to why we fast today, but there were specific behaviors like abstaining from alcohol, cutting hair, shaving, touching a corpse. Wonder how that worked for for undertakers. <laughs> <laughs> they had these some bodies all... sitting around. <laughs> <laughs> these this was the fasting of self denial. That those are some images from the Old Testament. And wasn't it in Acts where it's not entirely clear, but some people suggest that Paul took a form of a Nazarite vow in Acts eighteen. And if I can continue in the New Testament, probably the most known example of fasting is that of Jesus following his baptism. For 40 days and nights, he fasted. But that's not the only place that Jesus talked about fasting in the Sermon on the Mount. I love, I love his instructions in the Sermon on the Mount and fasting. To don't look like the gloomy hypocrites. They disfigure their faces so their fasting can be seen by others. I think that's one of the best lines in Scripture, just because of the way that it's said. Now, I'd love to hear it in the Greek, but you get my point. So, Matthew, and that's Matthew 6, 16 through 18, if you want a fun passage to preach on there. It seems like, uh, let me, not that I can add to it, but just uh, what's coming to mind. It seems like to me that if fasting is truly a spiritual discipline, other people won't know anything about it. Right. So we've talked about biblical reminders about fasting. Let me jump to John Wesley, since that's where these means of grace surface. Let's do that. It's one of the means of grace that Wesley thought people had the least understanding of, and they practiced the least. So he brings, up, brings us closer to our leadership message around hope. And here's what he had to say in his sermon. It was entitled Upon the Lord's, the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, number seven. I'm quoting Wesley here. And with fasting, let us always join fervent prayer, pouring out our whole souls before God, confessing our sins with all uh, of their uh, aggravations, humbling ourselves upon his mighty hand, laying open before him all our wants, all our guiltiness and help and helplessness. Okay, I think there's a couple of things in that that I think we need to unpack. Well, most of the time when we read Wesley, we have to unpack it. So <laughs> maybe the, the first thing is, is that the means of grace, in this case, fasting, is about humbling yourself before God, seeking to draw closer to God, and as we've said many times, to be in relationship with God. Yeah, and secondly, if, if I heard it right at the beginning of that passage of Wesley's sermon that you read, fasting and prayer were to be joined together. And didn't he also join fasting and works of mercy? I, I, I'm pretty sure he did, because when he talked about feeding, hung, feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and visiting the sick, those who are imprisoned, welcoming the stranger, it seems he took a direct line from the prophet Isaiah and living out his example. That's the same sermon that I mentioned before. He draws upon Isaiah 58. 
And, and this again, quoting Wesley, is not this the fast that I chose to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? So, Tim, what's the leadership message there? Sarah, I'm going to turn this back around on you. You tell me. <laughs> what is the leadership message there? Okay, I'll get us started. I hear two things unfolding. One echoes what we've explored in previous episodes. It's about deepening our relationship with God. So for leaders, fasting can be an essential means of grace when you're trying to make decisions, when you feel the weight of those decisions, and or somehow you found yourself at the center, being the center of attention instead of Jesus being the center of attention. As important as all of that is, we've said something similar about the other means of grace when we were talking in previous episodes about searching the scriptures and prayer and Holy Communion. I think the unique element of fasting for leaders that's related, I want to call it out, is humility and self-control. You humble yourself in fasting. Fasting is humbling. <laughs> There's only one person you can depend on, and it's God. It's a way to practice self-control. So you want to add to that, unpack that more, do something with those two things that I've mes mentioned? Sure. You always bring something else to mind when you say something. So I think humility and self-control are two reasons we do fast. So as you've heard me say before, it matters where you start. And so what's the reason for your fast? When I would ask why at that point, it's not that, that I'm questioning the fast. It's what's the purpose of the fast. So your, your motivation for fasting matters. If it's about humbling yourself before God to seek God's will and direction, God's way, great. If it's because you ate too much chocolate cake over the weekend, that's not <laughs> fasting. I think that's called a diet. Touche. <laughs> Well, let me say, say something more about self-control and connect it to where we started. And, and I think this is where it gets confused in our day. Cravings, things that have our attention and our allegiance, things like our possessions, wealth, phones, technology, our desire for entertainment, food, sex. I think probably I need to stop there. Fasting is a way to say, I'll not be controlled by my appetites. And there isn't a leader I know that can't benefit from that message. And isn't that the hope? Fasting guides us as leaders in abstaining from the idols of our day, if I can say it in just a little bit of a different way. That could be a whole different topic of conversation, but fasting draws us closer to God. Tim, <laughs> what wise words would you like to offer to close out this episode? Sarah, I confess I have not been one in terms of practicing the spiritual dis discipline of, of a fast in terms of food. I, that's just not been what I've done. I'd like to say that there were times over my ministry that I would fast from, from television even but that's not been what it is. But I have discovered <clears throat> in terms of what we talk about fast with self-control, I don't know if there's a whole lot of humility with it, but there is self-control. And that is with, the, with this little computer I carry around with me all the time, I'm at somebody's disposal 24 hours. I can get email, text messages, at, at any time, day or night. And I've made a decision myself is that there are only four or five people that could probably get me after a certain time in the evening or before eight o'clock in the morning. I've made that decision. I don't return emails unless it's an emergency over a weekend or a day off. I don't announce when those things are. 
But sometimes when people send me something on a Saturday evening, they may not hear from me until Monday morning. But it's not because I don't want to respond. It's because if I'm, if I'm in this 24 seven without giving myself a break, not, not for me, for my physical or emotional or mental uh, health, although that's helpful. Those are the times that I actually am spending time more intentionally with, with God in prayer all the time, every evening in reflection, very seldom, sometimes, sometimes somebody will get an email late at night for me or text because I'm saying I appreciate them. That's because of, of my pattern. Never will anybody get an email from me or a text late at night about work. Yeah. So part of this for me is that's what fast is, is, is setting boundaries, living into those boundaries and, and the times that you've set aside for yourself. As much as sometimes I like to be alone, I'm never alone. I've got a God who loves me and is always with me. I have a few people uh, surrounding me who I love and I think who love me. And because of that, I can set aside the time I need to be the person God created me to or continue to grow into. Yeah. What I'm hearing you point back to is the whole piece that we talked about in terms of our appetites. And we've, everybody listening to this has probably heard the, the talk and the research around the addiction that has come around our, our cell phones and that constant need for gratification and being able to see the see the like see the post see the see what is happening in the world and 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 literally the research has shown is it changes and impacts our our brain and our being so the spiritual is connected to the physical and giving ourselves that space and isn't that what fasting <laughs> That's exactly what it is. <laughs> it gives us the space to be present to God. And and I would also say to be present to one another. Especially as I think about the past two years, because that has been so much more difficult. I I'm sensing an increased urgency around it maybe urgency isn't the right word, a cre an increased desire around the need to be together and to be present together. There was one, this is silly, and then we'll wrap up the episode. I don't know that I'll even include this, but it, it was a post on Facebook that I saw that a restaurant would give you a discount if you put your phones. They had a little basket if you put your phones in the basket for the meal and were simply present to one another. But now there's a good motivation. <laughs> oh, that's a great motivation. So, so fasting is a means of grace, bringing us closer to God, developing that relationship doesn't have to be a 12 hour period of not eating. It's a time where we set aside specifically just to be with God. Yeah. And, and I think <clears throat> as I went back and was reviewing some of what Wesley wrote about fasting, that was part of what he encouraged people to do was to find what is the fast that you need to tend to. It wasn't always about fasting from food. It wasn't always about fasting from drink. And in, in that specific sense, I think he was referring to alcohol, not, not water or, in my case, Diet Coke. He was choosing and being able to identify what is the, I would say, what is the idol? What is the thing that is calling for your attention? that you need to make a conscious decision to step away from. And that's just coming back to your example and your wise, wise words, Tim Bias, that being able to set boundaries around one of the things that I would say has become an idol in, in our current culture, our cell phones, and that constant ability to be able to connect with one another. So 
Whatever form of fast you choose, a fast for a specific period of time, a fast from one of the appetites we pointed to that pull for our attention, whether it be food, technology, money, stuff, hope in fasting comes from drawing closer to God. Hope in fasting comes from drawing closer to the God that we know in Jesus and humbling ourselves to be in God's presence and take God's guidance. As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode, including references to Wesley's sermons and the scripture references that we called out in this episode at transformingmission.org forward slash 232. And remember, who you are is how you lead. Bye for now.